Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna start with a talk called uh, Build to Lose 101. Uh, unfortunately, this, this talk was previously meant for a UX track or UI track, and it was moved to the build tools track. So if you're interested in build tools for other stuff other than uh, JavaScript and front-end for, for uh, applications or libraries, uh, we will probably not be able to serve you well, but we'll try our best to explain you where uh, the world of build tools in JavaScript went where it went from and where it is going right now and what is probably the best thing to uh, work with today. Uh, so let's jump in and uh, let's go over there to the others. Yes. So, the most important thing of this talk, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves first. Uh, oh. The person on the left, that's Carl. Yeah, uh, hello guys. Uh, I've been a front-end developer for uh, more than five years now. For, yeah, it's, it's, for me, it feels kind of a lot. And I've been mostly working on, on cloud projects, uh, although my, my background went all the way to Java, and PHP and so on and so forth. So then I moved to, to cloud projects and I worked on front end. And I'm really Lego enthusiast, enthusiastic. So I like to building like, stuff together. So that's why I chose the uh, front end part. And uh, I have a co speaker with me. Uh, his name is uh, Tomik Tsoufal. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that will be me. Uh, um, when it comes to front-end, that's not my, my uh, main area of, of expertise. Uh, I call it front-end as a hobby. Fa, as, as we're used to call everything as a service, so I call it as a, as a hobby. Uh, instead of front-end, my expertise is mainly in analytics and uh, back-end stuff for, for different uh, areas of, of our cloud offerings. So I'll be, uh, I was doing AI ops or automation analytics in, in Red Hat land. And let's dig in. So the motivation for this talk or where the idea of having such a talk came from is originally there was an article, there still is an article, it's, it's from uh, year 2016 from Jose uh, Aguinaga uh, who wrote an article for Hacker Moon and this article is about what should I do if I want to start some JavaScript application from scratch right now in year 2016. And right now we're in year 2020 and we figured out that it kind of, many of the ideas or many of the key aspects that he mentioned still applies, though it kind of requires an update. And we would like to cover that. So if you would like to start some projects, start completely different stuff today and write it in JavaScript or run, write a front end for it, uh, what would be the advice tooling for you to use? Because the space evolved a lot and there are many different possibilities now than there were and the possibilities that there were available back then are probably no, not relevant anymore. So we're gonna start with defining some requirements, what we expect to uh, deliver, what we expect to uh, define uh, when we are, uh, what, what the project basically means for us. So let's imagine a completely uh, fictitious scenario. Yeah. So we have a team of developers and they are uh, writing some JavaScript code and this code should deliver either libraries for other teams to use or a web application, which is their product. 
and they want this application to be built and bundled and be able to deploy it in some uh, easy fashion so they don't need to spend tons of time uh, every time they want to release stuff. And they want it to be easy to set up, to be easy to use for new developers when they come on the team uh, to be do the same as well. And bear in mind, this is not uh, this is not uh, cloud native stuff. This is still uh, the legacy workflow on our laptops. Uh, so we'll try to we'll try to describe how to do this stuff. And since we are defining an application, since we are defi defining or we are defining a an, an library, we would like to use some kind of framework for that. We would like to not build everything from scratch and custom. We would like to incorporate some of the uh, major, uh, ma yeah, some mainstream, like mainstreamly used frameworks as, as we have now, so yeah. uh, React, Angular, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And we also use, want to use some uh, new cool JavaScript goodies. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with them, with them like spread operators, uh, Petro functions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we also want our applications to be able to run on almost anything, like, for instance, IE10, and so. So before uh, we can do that today, we should learn some lesson from the past. And uh, that's an aspect which is easy to forget about, that there's been some history in this tooling, there's been some historical development around this tooling, and there are some decisions, some decisions were made that kind of steer the wheel, uh, wheel of the uh, industry. So, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll pick from, from here. Uh, so, uh, the first thing we need to define is we need some task runner. Task runner. Uh, uh, in JavaScript, this isn't that easy, and first task runner that we uh, choose to speak about uh, dates back to the year 2012. Uh, that's, for, in JavaScript world, that's like Stone Age, mostly, even though it's eight years ago. Uh, and the first uh, runner uh, was called Grunt. Uh, it was relatively easy to use, uh, but it has uh, drawbacks. For the time, it wasn't that uh, thrown upon like it is now. Uh, it was using uh, temporary files, and it didn't allow piping uh, tasks. Um, so this was year 2012. Uh, I guess that most of you are familiar with uh, something called jQuery, uh, the most loved and hate DOM manipulation library, I would presume. Uh, so you see, between the year 2006 and 2012, uh, I call it like before the Stone Age, because you usually just had one file with copied code from Stack Overflow. Uh, you are either you injected your you know, JavaScript code in the HTML. It wasn't that pleasant. Um, I was coding in, in jQuery as well, and now I discourage you from using it because the new uh, JavaScript goodies actually allow you much more than jQuery and even though if you are like skilled with jQuery and you know that if you call a uh, dollar sign uh, you can query the DOM, the new JavaScript goodies allow that, allows that as well. But, but let's go back to, to the year 2012 uh, when the grant was, was released. Uh, also a new technology was uh, created uh, this fairly colorful bird called Bauer. It uh, was aiming to deliver uh, like JavaScript packages to, to front-end world. It heavily relied on, on GitHub uh, or any Git library that was uh, publicly available or available on your machine. Uh, but it also had plenty of goodies. For instance, uh, it had um, integration in Ruby where you can install RubyGem and it was basically served uh, JavaScript library through Bower. That was really cool. Um, and around that time, uh, folks uh, 
that were using Grunt, uh, didn't quite like the temporary files, didn't quite like that the, the Grunt wasn't able to use piping, uh, so they created, the clever folks at that time created Gulp. Uh, it was much faster, it allowed file piping, and, but it was became conf confusing. Uh, if I say it became confusing, uh, my first job was to introduce uh, 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 some task in Gulp, and I just opened this file with 200 lines of code, and I didn't quite kn know what to do, I just knew that the Gulp took a file, and at the end there was a different file, and for me it felt like a black box, even though there was used just some JavaScript and such. I didn't quite understood it. So uh, that's actually one of the reasons why these technologies were either replaced uh, completely or renewed. Uh, so uh, as, the as, as the browsers evolved, for instance, ES6, ES7, ES Next was introduced, uh, HTTP2, code splitting, uh, tree shaking, minifications and sources, and these uh, tools of dark age uh, weren't that useful anymore because they didn't quite keep the pace. So, uh, and also uh, we got introduced to NPM, uh, the behemoth of, of JavaScript libraries. You can think of any library, if you type it in NPM, there's a high probability that the library is already there. Uh, the fault uh, behind the NPM, uh, there's Google, so it has like huge servers to, to back it also. So it's, it's a really, really nice technology. And also introduced a task runner in NPM, so you don't really need N uh, task runners anymore because you have NPM or Yarn or any other like package management that can also run, run tasks. And right now, it's easier to configure the, config, the, the build uh, tools than it was before, even though some might argue that Webpack is really complicated. And we will show that it, it is really complicated. Trust me, it is less complicated than Gulp. I would add to, add to that. Yeah. Uh, one of the main reasons also why it was replaced is that the current tooling at the time wasn't able to properly uh, adapt to the new features of the ecosystem around it. So we had uh, HTTP2 uh, protocol features like code splitting or we required tree shaking for our not as well behaved developers as we used to have uh, to remove that code from our bundles and all these kind of stuff were not possible back then with Calp, or if they were possible, it was really hard to achieve them yeah. across the board. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because for instance, the Gulp just took one file and uh, at the end it was another file, but you want to have three shaking among all of your code files, or the code base, so yeah, thanks for the So, and the state of the JavaScript now is not easy. You have so many options to choose from. Uh, starting with the package management. You can either choose NPM or Yarn. Which one is better? Uh, there's one side that yours, Yarn is better. There's other side that yours, NPM is better. Both are good, both are bad. Let's focus what are they good at and let's talk about it. So Yarn is from Facebook, NPM is by Google. Both giant companies. Uh, Yarn supports workspaces. This is really awesome if you are working uh, on a large project uh, and uh, are unhappy with your code base, uh, you can go to, to, to monorepos and Yarn can, can help you tremendously. Uh, it's really great if you look at, for instance, uh, how Babel is doing it, how React is doing it, uh, how Patronify is doing, doing it, they use monorepos. You have multiple packages in one repository, you have same developers doing the, uh, the code, code reviews and so on and so forth. Uh, Yarn also introduced uh, log files as a first NPM followed. Uh, Yarn also introduced uh, local caching NPM followed. 
But at the same time, NPM <coughs> comes with the Node.js. So whenever you install Node.js, you automatically have NPM. In order to install Yarn, you have to install it through NPM. So it's kind of cum cumbersome. And if you have like a large uh, team of developers, I would say it's probably safer to use NPM because I personally like NPM as well. Uh, Yarn is nice. It's, it's, for me, it's niche that uh, you can use, but it has its drawbacks. And also, what is really awesome in NPM, it contains NPX. That's a really awesome tool. Uh, you can run your commands on the fly. That's, that's really great. And I would also like to uh, introduce PNPM, uh, although I don't think it's going to catch up as much as Yarn and NPM. But me personally, I come from Java world, and I come in really hard to that if you want to run your uh, newly pulled uh, Git repository, you have to run npm install on it. And uh, this pnpm, uh, it doesn't download the file, the, the libraries. It hard links them the way Linux meant it. Fortunately, this talk is not about uh, the package managers only. And we're going to focus rather the build tools because we think the package manager of choice from the previous two big mentions, so Yarn or, R, uh, or NPM, uh, either of them can do the job sufficiently and you won't run into, into any issues anymore. Um, so instead, we're going to focus mainly on the build tools uh, and what's available for us today are these three big projects. Well, the one on the left, the Webpack, that's kind of the behemoth on the, of, of the industry nowadays. It's like the mega build machines, mega build machine that can build nearly anything and, and is really, uh, really powerful tool. But there are also the other two, uh, Parcel and Rollup. Each of them has their own advantages and disadvantages, and we're going to cover those later in the, in the, in the talk as, as demos, so you're going to see how they perform and what's the difference and how that behaves. So when it comes to Webpack, as I said, it's an all-purpose build tool. Also, though, it requires configuration. It doesn't work well uh, out of the box. Uh, you usually, and in, in really, 99.9% .9 cases, you yeah. need to have some configuration for it. The, since it's so used it, and it is extensible, it already has a huge population of plugins and uh, other uh, extensions that can help you with the build process. On the other hand, uh, the parcel and trollop are much younger projects. Uh, though they focus each of them on a different aspect of the of the build process. When we go from the opposite direction, from the rollup, uh, rollup is focused on building libraries. So if you're building a um, library to be shared across teams or, or being published, uh, rollup is really focused on this type of uh, loads of, of this type of tasks. Uh, they introduced the static analysis f before the build to employ tree shaking there. So uh, they claim, and we're going to later find out if it's true or not, uh, they claim their build size when it comes to libraries is much smaller than what comes out of Webpack. And also they are focused on building the ES modules uh, and also out of these ES modules, they can build any other target. So they can build UDM, they can build mm -hmm. um, other stuff as well. And in the middle, we have Parcel, which is the third tool. Uh, and that one is actually focused on the other target that we have, that's the web applications. It introduces a zero config uh, build. So mm -hmm when you don't want to do any extra setup, any extra steps to, to actually spin up an application and make it running, uh, Parcel can do that for you without any 
configuration required. And since it's written from ground up, it's much, it claims it's much faster than Webpack since it can use multiple cores, so you can have distributed builds. Uh, and it also has file system caching, so if you're building the application uh, and you want to rebuild it, it's gonna take much less time. And since we're building packages, we don't need just these bundlers and compilers. Yep. We also need something called transpilers, which is a, uh, which is a, I think, an invention in <laughs> the biggest invention in JavaScript yeah, world. Yep, probably. <laughs> uh, and we have we listed two two main ones. Uh, one is TypeScript, which is like a flavor or superset of, of uh, features above JavaScript, but it allows you to use all that uh, fashion uh, in JavaScript, all that, all that uh, quirks and uh, cool features that new JavaScript offers, uh, but so, so, it's, so it's easier for developer to, to develop the application, but also, when it's compiled, it can support all the browsers which don't support this type of syntax or this type of features. It also, was, was the main advantage, and it's, it's also written in the name of it, it's TypeScript, so it's uh, statically typed, uh, and therefore, it allows uh, static verification of your code, so uh, you can build much more robust applications out of the box, basically via TypeScript. The other tool, it's called Babel, and it's like a set for uh, JavaScript. So it's an extensible uh, parser for JavaScript files that goes through each of the files and do some changes in there. So it's basically, uh, it's a find and replace tool uh, for different syntactic sugars or uh, different uh, module types basically and, and things like that. So, so you can modify the files that you are bundling or compiling afterwards uh, to uh, adhere to some kind of a standardized syntax. So, we're gonna focus rather the Babel stuff than TypeScript because TypeScript is fairly easy to use. You just use basically a bit different language, but Babel uh, is used over the regular JavaScript that you have. It's it's just another tool in the tool chain that you're gonna uh, use as a step in your build, in, in your build process. Uh, as you can see, we have listed a few config options in there. Uh, that's that's what Babel consumes. Uh, it has some presets, which is like bundles of plugins, so you don't need to define what plugins to use and what, what extra options these plugins have to have uh, set up to support your use case. And then you can list also your plugins. So as you can see, it's really, really extensible, and uh, you, can, you can define which Babel config to use based on your environment and based on what kind of build you do. So, I think that's the way. Okay, okay. Uh, enough with the boring stuff, with the, uh, uh, what, what was before, what is now, and such. Uh, let's focus uh, on some examples. Uh, we have prepared uh, two scenarios. Uh, one uh, is web application. Web application, uh, what the new web application usually has uh, we chose React, from, from React Framework because we're using React Framework. You might argue that uh, we would like to use Angular. In the build chain, it wouldn't probably change that much. Uh, we also want development ser server. So whenever developer writes this awesome code, uh, the browser refreshes and developer can see uh, these new awesome changes. Uh, we'd also have tree shaking because we heard about this new feature that's been introduced in JavaScript like a year or two ago that uh, it's that code analyze, analyzes. Uh, if you've ever worked in C, you probably heard about it as well. Uh, JavaScript heard about it two years ago, I believe. Uh, and we also want one configuration file for both 
developer, developers and the actual production. Uh, as it as it is as it is, it is uh, we want to also have static files like styles, images, videos, whatever you choose. So let me share with you uh, the demo demonstration uh, uh, over here. So first of all, uh, let's look at uh, at the Webpack application. Uh, how a config for a Webpack application could look like. Uh, as I said, uh, it's fairly easy, but at the same time, just just I'm going to jump in that. Uh, we have a single, just to, just to introduce the demo a bit, uh, we have an application, and we're going to build this application via different tools. So we're going to see how uh, easy or hard is to uh, come up with a configuration for such scenario and uh, how the build behaves basically, what kind of build you get out of it. So if it's bigger, smaller, uh, how the linking works and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I probably forgot to tell it. Uh, so uh, as you can see, uh, here is the back uh, config file. Uh, many of you probably saw it before. Uh, we have a lot of plugins just to uh, copy some files, create HTMLs, uh, extract CSS. Then you have these rules, nobody really understands them. Uh, then you have the dev server. Uh, and you also have uh, this optimization split chunks, chunk all. I have to Google that all the times, just to be clear. It's optimization thing and it's something uh, the clever guys at Google figure out. Uh, nobody else can understand it as well. And uh, let's see how the, uh, not this one, but the, how the uh, actual build looks like. Uh, uh, not this one. Yeah. Too much. Yeah. So uh, if, we were, uh, if we were to run npm start or, or npm, yeah, npm start for this instance, uh, this is what you would see. Uh, this is what you would see in, in your command line. Uh, it says that you have like a couple of JavaScript files. Uh, one of them is seven megabytes uh, big. Wow, how that happened? Uh, then you suddenly run npm run build, and you can see that the vendors is not that big because of the tree shaking that comes with the webpack. That's a really awesome feature. Uh, but as you, as you saw, the config is not that easy. When it comes to the configuration, uh, this is Carl's daily job. So he's basically uh, doing this kind of stuff on a daily basis. But it still took him about an hour to build it from scratch, just to be sure that all the required stuff are in there and to be sure that the application works. So if you change something in the application layout, you would still need to go to this config file and adjust it. Or if you choose to use a different, for example, styling uh, thing, not just plain CSS or uh, you would rather use SAS or something else, uh, you would need to probably adjust the config. So it's, it's not as easy as, as it might as it might look like yeah oh it doesn't look easy so, uh, so probably that's probably fulfilled <laughs> yeah so let's move on to uh, to a parcel config file uh, I can't find any find any uh, that's because uh, if you want to uh, run a parcel build uh, you just do this just r uh, run one command uh, parcel build for instance, the dog, dog's application, uh, you want it to be uh, on public URL, just, just, do, just a slash. Uh, you don't want any uh, source maps. And you want it to be in, the, uh, in one folder. Uh, we're, point, we're pointing it out uh, to one HTML file. We're not pointing it to, to the JavaScript file because, uh, let me show you how, how the index looks like. This is something similar to what it looked like before. 
like in 2014, 15 or so. You have just one, one script included in here, and you would expect that in the index.js there would be the entire application. No, we have classic uh, React application that is using imports and, and such. So that's a very clever idea. Uh, but at the same time, let me show you the preview. Uh, the cold start can take a few seconds. It can take up to tens, tens of seconds. And uh, I showed you the, the docs application that is fairly, fairly okay, fairly small. But what happens if you are uh, going to use a library that doesn't fully support tree shake or relies on tree shaking? You might end up with a bit of problems here. This is why everybody hates um, JavaScript developers because their applications are huge. So that's because there is no tree shaking probably. And that's one of the problems with the uh, Presenting. Uh, this is one of the problems uh, uh, that has uh, a parcel. So, as we said, Webpack has a huge selection of plugins. Uh, it is a large community, so whenever you find some, something like you stumble upon a problem, the terminal yells at you uh, an error, you can just paste the error into, into Google, and probably Stack Overflow has tens of replies to it. Uh, it has a relatively good documentation. I, I could find anything in there, uh, but it's hard to set up, and it requires a lot of boilerplate. There are tons of, thousands of uh, boilerplate applications just to bootstrap a React application, be it Material UI, be it Webpack. If you Google Material UI, Webpack, React into a GitHub, you will probably find tens repositories that does just this. Uh, it all comes back to the extensive configuration because it's not easy to figure out the configuration, right? Uh, and for simple use cases, you still need a lot of configuration and you still need to know what you are doing with the webpack. So it's usually easier to start with some bootstrap and you're basically stripping yeah. out of the bootstrap what you don't need and uh, yeah. that's probably not the best idea to, yeah. to spend days before you even start developing application. So you can go uh, to parcel, it's easy to set up, as I said, you just point it to an HTML file uh, where you include your, your JavaScript files. Um, yeah, but it doesn't have has tree shaking, which is fairly problematic. It has some experimental ones. I tried them and they work okay-ish. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And uh, it's harder to use in specific projects. If you want, for instance, custom variables from, from environment, you have to change the, the build and such. The thing is with tree shaking is that if you use well-behaved or libraries or dependencies like material UI, you don't need that. You, you can really work your way or, or make the application work uh, even without the tree, tree shaking required. So, mm -hmm. But if you use something which is not written in a way that it's... It, it relies on tree shaking, yeah. uh, you might end up with a big, part, uh, big chunk of JavaScript. Okay, you might ask how to actually write an NPM package library. Uh, many of you will probably and are probably writing web applications, and some of you, I believe, are writing uh, a uh, library. Uh, so uh, let's define the library we want to, uh, to create. Uh, it has like you. You export one huge chunk of file called index.js that has all the files, and you also want to export uh, small parts of your library in order to support the tree shaking, actually. 
So we're going to show you how to do that. Uh, it also uh, has, needs the support for named and default exports. You can't have 10 default exports in your index.js. That's not how JavaScript actually works. And, and uh, it removes the external libraries. You don't really want to have a library that also includes your React and Redux and other libraries. That's, that's not how it works. Yeah, that's, these are requirements we expect from our build tools to be able to deliver based on our library code. So uh, if we are developing a library, we want the build, the actual output of the build process to fulfill these needs for the developers that's going to use the library. So, uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, let's, let's dive in. Uh, this is how your webpack config might look like. Uh, these two functions uh, are uh, fairly easy and are the core principle of uh, having multiple uh, exported files. Uh, as you can see here, we export index.js and we also export everything that is in source components. We have two components in, he in here uh, and it bundles into multiple uh, types of, of bundles. Uh, UMD, uh, it doesn't have ESM as of yet, uh, but Webpack 5 promised it to be there. So we'll see about like in two, three months. Will probably be there. And you might say that it looks kind of similar ish. The rules are still here, and there are no plugins. Uh, we just defined the externals here uh, based on the dependencies. So please have your dependencies in order not to put develop, developer dependencies in here. It would be quite strange. Uh, and what, what it looks like on the, when built. It creates three folders, three like environments. One is CommonJS, the other one is, is modules, ESM, and the, the other one, the, the last one, is UMD. That's where you would go if you want to have like one index.js imported. Uh, we also tell you that in your package uh, JSON, you should always include main and module, so when, uh, you are importing something from if someone is going to use your library and they import uh, your index, uh, they uh, the the bundle file or the bundler chooses the correct one. Uh, so yeah, let's look at rollup as we were discussing it before. Do you have any metrics on the build? For yeah, the, for yeah, the definitely, pack? definitely. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, uh, so this is how the, the output of, of build would look like. Uh, there's just a couple of kilobytes uh, for each uh, environment. It's nothing too, too fancy, nothing too complicated. So we don't expect anything huge. We don't expect anything to, like strange to be happening here. Just bear in mind, there are, these are kilobytes. So let's move on to roll up. They promised us something better. They promised, that, promised us that it will be, the bundles will be smaller, that they support ESM, and that it will be much better. So we still have this one function to, to grab all things in source code. Uh, we have some, some globals, some externals, uh, some Babel options, uh, a few plugins, those are mostly just to resolve JavaScript, uh, post CSS uh, in, injects, and, and one analyzer. Uh, so we have two, two environments, uh, CommonJS and ESM, and we also have uh, UMD. And the output looks like, the ESM actually looks like, uh, 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 wrong, wrong, wrong dist. ESM actually looks like ESM. It does have exports and imports uh, rather than in the Webpack world where you have like, like this strange thing. So that's a huge plus. You have ju just the small files. True shaking is, is com 
coming out, out of the box. That, that's, that's awesome. Uh, you also have other uh, environments, CommonJS and UMD, just to support all the browsers or, or any other goodies. And uh, let's look at the, the, the statistics. Uh, okay, so for uh, uh, it has the file files are really small. It has only a few bytes, no no kilobytes, just bytes. As you can see, it's really really nice. Even for the UMD, it is just just a couple of bytes. It's really really nice to see. So, yeah. Uh, let's dive back to here. So what we saw is that uh, Webpack uh, is just Webpack. It's what we expect it from. But the rollup, that's fairly interesting. The bundles were smaller. It supports ESM natively. And even though it has named exports, like me personally, I've once found out that my build was broken because of named exports in Webpack. And we found out all the way in production because uh, tests weren't failing at all. Uh, tests weren't failing at all. Uh, nothing happened. It just happened only when we used the library in production because of the named export. Because Webpack assumed the named export was default. default. So that's when we looked at the build tools and we saw the rollup. And with the rollup, we didn't experience this issue anymore. So, on the other hand, when you compare Webpack and rollup configs, you see not much of a difference. It's it's fairly big and structured configs, so you still need to come up with that. You still need to invent those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it also. Uh, the drawback for Webpack is that it doesn't support ESM modules. As I said, Webpack 5 is promising them. We'll see if they deliver, it, deliver them. So, yeah. So, on a bit lighter note, uh, we kind of draw some parallels and take this lightly as, as a bit of a joke, not, not too seriously. Uh, when we compare these two build tools, uh, we kind of draw a parallel between Vim and Webpack. It's a really robust tool, big tool, that can achieve nearly anything you want it to achieve, but you need to know how to configure it. You need to know how to use it. And it's not always as easy as you would expect it to be to, to support different scenarios. On the other hand, if we're writing a document in Vim, uh, and we want to build a PDF out of it or, or just have a text document. Uh, if we use Parcel, we can draw a parallel to uh, Office, World, uh, Office Word, uh, which gives us what we expect it to. So it gives us some styling, we can draw a document, we can include pictures, and we get a document out of it. Uh, but we can't, we can't, uh, use this as, a, as our IDE, for example. Or we can, but we are not that masochistic. Yeah. Uh, and the last one is Rollup, which is, a, which is like an IDE, basically, yeah. which, which allows you uh, really great possibilities when it comes to uh, going uh, through the rabbit hole to, to the uh, internals of the code. Yeah. But when we want uh, when we want it to be easy to use, it's not as well as easy to use uh, when we compare it to the MS Word, for example. Uh, just bear in mind, uh, these three uh, package libraries were chosen by us. Uh, they were deliberately <coughs> chosen uh, to draw a parallel between Webpack. Because oftentimes when I speak to developers, they use Webpack, even though they don't understand it fully. So we wanted to show you that uh, Okay, we have Webpack, but we also have a parcel. We also have a rollup, which is rollup is really awesome for libraries. Parcel is really awesome for small uh, applications, and don't be afraid to experience with uh, with them. Uh, like, uh, and you can go dig deeply and find some different uh, 
build tools that fits your needs. So, yeah, this was the aim of this presentation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new or just enjoyed the time here. And last but not least, if you are interested in the source code we use for the demos and you would like to see um, or build this for yourself or you want to use the config files, you can find it on that link in the middle uh, on GitHub. And that's probably all of it from us. Thank yeah. you for your attention. Thank you for uh, listening to us. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Feel free to ask. Yes, yes. So the question was that uh, if you're new to the industry or new to the uh, front-end development world and you want to start a project from scratch, uh, it's still fairly complicated to set it up uh, and that's... That's yeah. not a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, would, no. I would suggest to you uh, try using some some pre-configured uh, uh, configs. Like I, either that, but if you're starting applic writing application on the library, uh, you can go pretty well with the parcel, which is a zero config thing, and you just need to install it via node, uh, which adds it to your package.json. Uh, and then you would just define one build command that would build the application for you. So uh, this is maybe the right. biggest simplification we can offer yeah. for, for onboarding. Yeah. Okay. I actually have an offer for you. You can get the, li the link from Karel. So there is a website called createapp.dev where you can just checkbox in what you want in your stuff and it creates your boiler for later to download it and you can work with it. Yeah. Uh, that, that I wanted to point out that there are so many boilerplates. You just choose which one you want, download the the, the, the um, stack, and you are free to free to go. But with these boilerplates, there is a problem that you might end up with something that you really don't either don't use or don't need. So, as with any boilerplate. And uh, any other question? Okay. Thank you very much.